Uh, again, I'd like to thank Paul for preparing these slides. And uh, there's a couple of errors, but they're not Paul's, they're mine. Uh, he prepared exactly what I asked him to do. And as we go through, I'll correct them as necessary. But you see the five cent West Point stamp issued May 26, 1937 at West Point. And it was the fifth and final stamp Army series, or at least the Army half of the Army Navy series of 1936 and 1937. The genesis of this stamp has interesting background. In uh, 1935, the graduation speaker at West Point was President Roosevelt. And when he came up from Washington to West Point, he was escorted by Douglas MacArthur, who was the chief of staff of the army at the time. And James Farley, as I'm sure you all know, was the uh, postmaster general. And while they were there, the three of those gentlemen had a little conversation and MacArthur suggested that there be issued a three cent first class rate stamp honoring the US Military Academy. And uh, Roosevelt and Farley seemed to be sympathetic with the suggestion. So when MacArthur ba got back to his office in Washington, he phoned the head of the Department of Drawing at West Point, a Colonel Alexander, and directed him to ask his staff to prepare models for a possible stamp. Well, soon thereafter, MacArthur left Washington, headed for Philippines, where he served as the military governor, and that initiative seemed to have died in the morning. But Roosevelt remembered that, and soon thereafter, realizing, realizing that, that the storm clouds of war were building over Asia and over Europe, and that the U.S. would inevitably be drawn into conflict, wanted to engender support from the American people for the U.S. military, <clears throat> which at that time was tiny and way underfunded. And he understood that in an era when everybody used postage stamps, that this was an effective means of communicating with the American people. So MacArthur directed Farley to provide a series of five Army and five Navy stamps that uh, would celebrate the heroes of the Army and the Navy, and that the ultimate, the high value stamp would celebrate the history of West Point and Annapolis. Uh, those stamps were issued between 15 December 1936 and the West Point stamp, the final stamp, was issued May 26, 1937 in uh, West Point. All the others were issued in Washington, DC. Now let's take a look at some of the official cancels. Slide please. They, there were only three official cancels for the first day covers. Uh, the one machine cancel and two hand cancels one with the short bar and, and one with the long bar. Obviously, when you're looking at first day covers, uh, there are more single stamps on a cover than there are multiples. More multiples than there are blocks, more blocks than there are plate number blocks. And obviously the more scarce are, of course, the uh, plate number blocks on cover. All these covers are 86 years old, so. Some of them show a little bit of wear and tear. You wanna try and get the best condition covers with the strongest and clearest strikes. And I've tried to pull some of those that illustrate. Um, on the first day of issue, exactly a quarter million stamps were sold that day at West Point. That's 50,000 sheets of 50 stamps each. About 160,000 first day covers were postmarked that day. 55,000 of which were passed back uh, or over the counter first day covers. And presumably the other, other 105,000 uh, went into the mail stream. Now, my goal for this presentation is not to make you an expert on Army first day covers, but instead to make you think, you know, this first day cover stuff is not as trivial as I thought it was. And you can actually put together a pretty interesting collection for not much money. 
I'm not going to show any of the high value Dorothy Knapps or McIntyre or other hand painted covers or some of the really scarce things that command high value. Most of these things are fairly inexpensive, although not necessarily cheap. Now let's look at some of the unofficial cancels. Next slide. Thanks. Uh, I'll be showing about two slides for each category. There's two interesting here. One of them was canceled in Annapolis, Maryland, and the other in Fort Montgomery, New York. Now, the way the unofficial cancel worked was somebody would be at West Point, they'd purchase those stamps, they'd go to another post office and get them postmarked. And that's how you get unofficial postmark. So for this cover that was canceled at Annapolis, somebody presumably the cache maker, Nix, purchased the stamps at New York, took the train to New York City, changed trains, took the train to Baltimore, and then rented a car or took a bus to Annapolis and had it postmarked. Now the postmark from Fort Montgomery, New York, was a lot easier to get because Fort Montgomery is only a couple of miles outside the gate of West Point. Next slide. Now here's a couple other uh, unofficial cancels. All of these were postmarked aboard naval ships. All three of these ships are destroyers. The first one canceled aboard uh, the USS Manley. Uh, Captain John Manley was an officer of the Continental Navy. Uh, he was a Commodore in Washington's Navy. Uh, the USS Manley was launched in 1937. Uh, and at the end of the war, it was sold for scrap, the end of World War II. The middle cache there was prepared by the Universal Ship Cancellation Society. Uh, the Leary was named after Navy Lieutenant, which is the equivalent of an Army Captain, who was awarded the Navy Cross in World War I posthumously. Uh, Lieutenant Leary was 24 at the age of his death, and he died saving sailors in a shipboard fire. The USS Leary was torpedoed on Christmas Eve, December 1943, by a German submarine. 98 sailors uh, died in the North Atlantic and were lost at sea. The final naval cover with uh, an embossed uh, seal is. Uh, named for Admiral William uh, Moffat, who was widely perceived as the father of naval aviation. He was awarded a Congressional Medal of Honor at the Battle of Veracruz uh, in uh, April of 1914. The uh, Moffat was based out of Newport, Rhode Island, and like uh, the uh, Manly, was sold for scrap at the end of World War II. Next slide, please. I'm gonna show some uses and some destinations and some signatures, just to showcase the, all the different things that you can do when you're collecting first aid covers. You know, here's three air or two airmail first aid covers. Uh, showing the current airmail rate of uh, six cents. Many argued that we shouldn't have had a four cent stamp because that didn't pay for anything other than as a makeup rate. And that the West Point stamp, rather than being five cents, should have been six cents because at least that paid for something. And the four cent stamp should have been a five cent stamp, which paid the surface overseas rate for a one ounce letter. Uh, but as it was, the one cent stamps paid for a domestic postcard. The two cent army stamp paid for a domestic local drop rate for a first class letter. Three cents was a first class letter rate or for an international postcard. Four cents, nothing. Then five cents, the surface international rate. Both of these have labels that say air mail. Those are known as etiquettes uh, from the French word. And of course, the calligraphy address on the bottom uh, cover uh, also makes it highly desirable. Next slide, please. These are special delivery 
first eight covers. Of course, the vast majority of uh, five cent FTCs are with one stamp. Uh, few of the FTCs pay for extra services such as air mail. And of course, the more services and the more uh, things that were tacked on, the more expensive the covers are and the less common they are. Special delivery at the time was a 10 cent fee. So since these went by surface, I mean by, uh, you know, they were not overseas, they were domestic. The rate for a special delivery letter was 13 cents. So these were overpaid by seven, seven cents. Special delivery was important in 1937 because much mail was not delivered to homes or offices but were held at the post office for pickup. And people had to stop by the post office to pick it up and special delivery obviated that requirement. Next slide. This is airmail, special delivery, FTCs. Now, uh, as I mentioned, airmail was six cents, uh, special delivery was 10 cents. And so the total postage for an airmail special delivery was six cent, 16 cents. So these were overpaid by four cents. Uh, the Anderson cache at the top is fairly common, but the Crosby cache at the bottom is unusual, at least for the five cent army stamp or other army stamps although there's lots and lots of Crosby caches with Navy stamps. Crosby caches are characterized by thermographed uh, text and designs and the photograph that you see posted in there. That photograph is the tower of the administration building at West Point where the post office was located and where first day covers were issued. Uh, next slide, please. Now, here's some registered first day covers. At the time, registration fee was five cents. Uh, domestic postage was three cents. So total was 18 cents. And so these are two cents overpaid. Now, to put this in perspective, today, a first class letter is 58 cents. So if you figure three cents equals 58 cents, uh, in today's uh, equivalent, this would be about $4.06 in postage, a registered domestic letter. You'll notice that the registered letters were numbered. They were tracked in a very different way. Then first class mail, they're tracked individually. And based on the numbers, I think one could determine how many of the 600,000 first day covers that were prepared were actually registered covers. I would venture that it was a very small percentage. Now, at this time, registered covers were supposed to have a mute cancel on the front, just an obliteration but the cancel with the date and the location of time and time was supposed to be on the reverse. So obviously the post office department made an exception for first day covers. Next slide, please. Now we got registered airmail covers. And uh, <clears throat> because registration was 18 cents, I'm sorry, 15 cents, and uh, airmail was six cents, the total was 21 cents. So you had to add an extra penny in postage. And uh, you'll notice in the top cover, there's an autograph and it's hard to make out the signature. That's Grace A. Harrington. She was the uh, postmaster. Uh, she was an unmarried army daughter. The army had a phrase at that time that the army takes care of their own. And so the West Point administration put her in charge of the post office where she remained for many, many years. In fact, the author 
Can you see me down in the corner, Paul? We can. Okay. Well, the, the uh, author of this book, Postmark West Point, has done a lot of research on uh, Grace Harrington. And I re was able to find a article that published in the uh, New York Times where she was trying to be replaced by the local US congressman for political patronage because postmasters were often political appointees. And the local congressman lost that war because the entire army leadership in Washington went to bat for Ms. Harrington and she stayed around a long time. Next slide. These are a couple first day covers that are autographed by uh, James A. Farley, James Aloysius Farley, the Postmaster General. Uh, Farley was a uh, career politician he had been chair of the uh, New York State Democratic Party, chair of the Democratic National Committee, and postmaster general all at the same time. Unlike today where you have to resign all your board positions when you become a presidential appointee, which is why I had to resign from my position as president of the American Philatelic Society, much as I hated to do that. Farley also managed Roosevelt's campaigns, both for governor of New York and for, he was uh, chairman of the, uh, or managed Roosevelt's campaign for US president. Farley preferred to use green ink in his autographs, but was not consistent and would use black ink or blue ink whenever he didn't have a green pen. Now, there's no record of Farley being present at the first day cover ceremony. So one might infer that uh, the owners of these caches uh, or these covers mail them into Farley with a stamped self-addressed envelope and ask that he autograph it and return it to them. Next slide. Now we saw a couple covers autographed by the Postmaster General. Here's two more. These are both autographed by Grace Harrington, the local postmaster. Now, I'd like to point out uh, one thing about these two covers. Uh, you'll see that both of them have a, a plate number ending in 80 and 81. And I mentioned that 50,000 panes of 50 stamps were sold at West Point on the day of issue. All of those panes of stamps had one of these two plate numbers, although there were four plates used to print the West Point stamp. The other two plates ending in the number or digit two and three were used to service first day covers in Washington, which is, they call that the second day, second day covers. And I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So those are the only two plate numbers that are shown on West Point Postmark FTCs. Uh, next slide, please. These are cache maker autographs. The first one from Torkel Gundel and the second from Aubrey, uh, Dean Aubrey. Now, one would think that caches of this era autographed by the cache maker would be common, but one would be wrong because very few are. Now, Torkel Gundel, who produced the first cache there, top of the page, owned an advertising company in Chicago, and he produced caches from 1934 to 1941. He was born in Copenhagen, 1902. He moved to Chicago when he was 10 years old. Uh, and was employed for a long time uh, by Boys Life magazine. Dean Aubrey, who produced and autographed the cover at the bottom, was a commercial artist and industrial design engineer. He was born in Chicago and uh, right out of uh, high school, his first job was working for Outdoor Life. 
Uh, Aubrey attended the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts, and his first FDC was for the 1936 Susan B. Anthony. And his last was for 1938 Northwest Territory stamp. So Aubrey was a great designer and drawer, but he only produced stamps uh, or first day covers for a little over two years. Next slide. These are a couple covers autographed by governors. The first one by Governor Herbert H. Lehman. He was a Democrat who was in office from 1933 to 1942. He was the 45th governor of New York. He also served as a US Senator for eight years from 49 to 57. Interestingly, Lehman succeeded Roosevelt as governor of New York and succeeded John Foster Dulles as United States Senator from New York. Of course, Dulles has an airport named after him today outside Washington. And of course, there's no record of uh, Lehman having attended the first day ceremony at West Point. So like the others we discussed, this was probably mailed to Lehman with a stamp self-addressed envelope and a request for autograph. And the bottom cover is autographed by Henry H. Blood, who was the seventh governor of Utah. He served two four-year terms from 33 to 41, also a Democrat. He attended Brigham Young Academy, which evolved into Brigham Young University. Uh, and likewise, he was not known to have attended or would unlikely to have attended the uh, first day cover ceremony. Next slide. Now, if you're a football fan, you've probably heard of Doc Blanchard who autographed the top cover. Doc Blanchard graduated from West Point in 1947 uh, and it won the Heisman Trophy in 1945. Blanchard was from McCall, South Carolina. And Scott, you'll know where that is. Uh, not only did Blanchard win the Heisman Trophy, which was awarded by the Downtown Athletic Club of New York City, but that same year, he also won the Maxwell Award for the best player in college football, which was awarded by the Sports Writers Broadcasters of America, as well as the NCAA head coaches. And Blanchard won the Sullivan Award, which is presented by the Amateur Athletic Union to the most outstanding amateur athlete. It's the big three and Blanchard won them all. Uh, he served 24 years in the US Air Force, retired as a Colonel. It's hard to imagine any Heisman Trophy winner today serving a career in uniform. Harry Woodring, Wood, it says Woodbury. Uh, it was just my bad, bad handwriting that made it turn out to be Woodbury. It's a really Harry H. Woodring, R-I-N-G. Uh, Woodring was a Democrat. He was the 25th governor of Kansas. He was the Secretary of War from 1936 to 1940. Prior to that, he was the Assistant Secretary of War from a little teeny town in Kansas with fewer than, well, a little over 300 people population uh, in the most recent census. Uh, the problem was Woodring was an extreme isolationist and Roosevelt understood the necessity for US getting into World War II. He knew that they would be drawn in despite their isolationist tendencies. So Woodring was a bad fit. In fact, the Secretary of Interior, who we will talk about later, Harold Ix, uh, met with FDR on two occasions to urge FDR to fire this guy, Woodring. Uh, FDR calculated that the political cost in Kansas would be too high. So instead, he selected as Woodring's deputy somebody who had exactly opposite views from his boss. Uh, 
Scott, you've probably seen that in politics before. Next slide. Uh, I wanted to show some overseas surface FDCs, which is kind of what the uh, five cent rate paid for. You can see the uh, first cover there was addressed to uh, Dr. Uh, Sherwood Hall in Korea. Uh, it was produced by, it, Lin Print Caches were produced by George Lin, the famous stamp dealer and, and printer, but most significantly, the founder and publisher of Lin's Weekly Stamp News. Uh, this FDC sent to Dr. Sherman is interesting because Dr. Sherman was a medical missionary and educator in Korea for 44 years. Among many, many accomplishments, she founded the Pyongyang School for the Deaf and Blind and also founded what is today the leading medical school in South Korea, the Korea University College of Medicine. Now, that second uh, FTC is mailed to a uh, Park Smith Esquire in the Strand, South Africa, which is in South Africa, uh, actually in Cape Town. Strand is a uh, subdivision of Greater Cape Town. This uh, cachet was produced by uh, Walter Zube uh, of Long Island, New York. His first cover, uh, first day cover was in 1936 for the Texas Centennial issue. Uh, he was also an early member of the uh, Art Cover Exchange, as was Dr. Sherwood. Uh, most of Zoo Base covers were printed in his basement. Of course, all first day covers to Africa are scarce, just based on their destination. Uh, and doing some research on the recipient, Park Smith, I discovered that there is a street in the Strand in Cape Town, South Africa, that is named uh, Park Smith Street. Next slide. Now, here's an overseas surface registered first aid cover. Now, these are really scarce, as you can see by the fact that in 24 years of very diligent searching, this is the only example I've found for the West Point stamp. Uh, the 20 cents pays five cent registration fee and exactly the five cent surface international fee. It's a Grimsland cache. Henry Glim, uh, Grimsland was born in Norway. Uh, he came to the United States when he was eight years old. He lived in Chicago uh, and he made his career as an engraver. Uh, at one point he began working for Artcraft in, uh, making caches. Uh, Grimsland produced his first cache in 1933 and his last cache was in 1951. And he uh, was a great designer and great engraver, beautiful caches. Next slide, please. Now, this is an overseas airmail in the US special delivery. This is one of the errors on my part. This was not airmail in the US, it was airmail in Europe. Five cent surface rate to Germany, three cent surcharge for airmail in Europe, and a 10 cent special delivery fee, which means the total required postage was 18 cents, so a two cent over, uh, overpayment. And uh, the little town of Barman, that's uh, the address there for uh, Elizabeth Rademacher, uh, merged with four other metropolitan areas to form the current industrial of uh, Wuppertal, which is in the state of North, Round, North Rhine, Westphalia for you German philatelists. Uh, that's in the Western part of central Germany. Next slide, please. Here's a couple of uncached first day covers to overseas destinations. 
And if you didn't know what you were looking for, or you encountered these covers in a box of dealer stock, you wouldn't realize that these were first day covers because they don't, are not so, uh, don't, are not indicated as such. But uh, first day covers to an overseas or foreign destination, as you might expect, are far more scarce than, you know, regular postage. Uh, the top covers to Northern Rhodesia, that uh, Northern Rhodesia is now Zimbabwe and uh, Zambia and uh, not a lot of going on there uh, today, uh, philatelically, other than uh, extra stamps made for collectors. Uh, and then the bottom first day cover is addressed to Shanghai, China. It's got the Chinese receiving marks on the front and on the back, which make it highly desirable. And of course, the beautiful calligraphy address on the front doesn't hurt either. Next slide. Uh, here's a couple of distinguished recipients. Harold Ix, the Secretary of the Interior, I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, he was a philatelist. Uh, it says he was uh, Secretary of the Interior from 35 to 46. That's an error on my part. He was the Secretary of the Interior from 33 to 46, almost 13 years in that cabinet position. Uh, and he's the one I mentioned urged FDR to get rid of, rid of Woodring, the Secretary of War. Uh, Ix was responsible for implementing much of FDR's New Deal. Uh, interestingly, prior to his involvement in politics, he was president of the Chicago NAACP, and his son was President Clinton's deputy chief of staff. Henry Wallace, also a philatelist, uh, and the, you can see this FTC is on the corner card of uh, Farley. Uh, Wallace was from Iowa. Uh, they comes, he comes from a successful family. They published a widely read newspaper called Wallace's Farmer. Uh, when he left Department of Agriculture, uh, he went to work as, during the war, of course, as chair of the board of uh, economic warfare. And then he got promoted to chair of the supply priorities and allocation board. And then he became the secretary of commerce. And then he became Roosevelt's vice president. Now, interestingly, when Roosevelt ran for president for his third term, he didn't choose Wallace to run with him. He picked Harry Truman. Next slide. Now, one area that's fun to collect is FTCs that are on hotel stationery. Uh, these can be beautifully engraved as the uh, bottom cover illustrates. The one at the top is fairly pedestrian, but I chose to show it because it's the cover from the Hotel Thayer at West Point. And uh, if you turn it over and look at the back, it indicates that. Uh, the bottom cover is the uh, Hotel Bannock. Bannock is an Indian tribe and it portrays their uh, chief of that tribe, uh, Chief Taihe. Uh, his full name was Old Man Chief, Chief Taihe, who was born in Wyoming. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> These are a couple slides, or uh, FTCs rather, that were uh, that have caches or corner cards from stamp clubs. Uh, those aren't very plentiful either. Uh, I have not been able to figure out where the Mutual Benefit Stamp Club was. If some diligent researcher can let me know, I'd be uh, grateful. Uh, none of these stamp club or hotel FTCs or very few of what I'm showing are actually in 
the standard catalog, Malone's Planty Photo Encyclopedia of First Day Covers. These, it, and because they're not cataloged, people don't collect them very often. So very covers are not in high demand. So uh, they're not expensive. And these are two more examples of that. Uh, this blue rubber step, uh, rubber stamp, uh, mutual benefit stamp club, uh, F cache, of course, matches of, of the color of the stamp. And they produced caches for the other four stamps in the series with matching colors. Uh, the Chattanooga Stamp Club was founded in 1932. The club is still in existence. Uh, in fact, they meet the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, they're members of the Southeastern Federation of Stamp Clubs. And uh, the latest example of the Chattanooga Stamp Club first day cover I've been able to find was uh, 1983, and the earliest was 1936. Next, next slide. These are interesting. These are Civil War patriotic envelopes uh, that were produced in profusion during the Civil War. So these envelopes were more than 70 years old when they were used to make these first day covers. Uh, the bottom cover is interesting in that the servicer of the FDC cut out the portraits of Sherman, Grant, and Sheridan from the Army three cent stamp and pasted them onto the three leaves of the clover, which was the insignia of the Second Corps. Uh, Second Corps was famous for having been engaged in so many. Uh, tough fought battles. Uh, their most famous commander was Winf Winfield Scott Hancock, who was portrayed on a commemorative postage stamp in 1995, the Civil War commemorative sheet. Uh, as an example of how much fighting this Corps did of the 100 regiments in the Union Army that lost the most men in battle, 35 of those regiments fought under the Second Corps banner. And likewise, these are very uncommon, typically made only one uh, or at most two. Next slide. Now, these are business corner cards that are made into uh, first day covers. Uh, they too exist in small numbers. Typically an employee would uh, service one or two envelopes from his company. So if you're collecting FTCs of a specific issue and you see one of these, buy it because you probably are not gonna see it again. But an exception to that is the first one with the Eastern Airlines cache, because it's addressed to uh, Winfred, Winifred Milton Grandy, who is a cache maker. Grandy was a prolific cache maker, but he was trained as a sculptor at Yale University graduating in 1931. And despite his training, most of his career he worked for the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad and produced caches in his spare time. The second cache or corner card FTC is the Morton Salt Company. Now, Morton Salt was founded in 1848 in Chicago, and the headquarters is still there 174 years later. The company logo with a little girl with an umbrella carrying a canister of salt is pouring uh, and the motto, when it rains, it pours. These were established, the logo and the motto were established in 1914. And when a poll was done in 1989, this motto and logo were identified as one of the top 10 most identifiable logos and mottos 
in the United States for commercial products. Next slide, please. We're about done. Personal corner cards. These, like the business corner cards, uh, were done in ones and twos. They're not catalog. They're not in high demand, even though they're scarce. <clears throat> and, and like these two, are usually uh, addressed to the person whose name appears in the corner card. Next slide. Business address FTCs, these are even less common than the uh, personal corner cards. Uh, Eugene Klein, the addressee in the top, uh, was an internationally known stamp dealer and auctioneer. He was president of the American Philatelic Society from 1935 to 1937. And he was inducted into the APS Hall of Fame in 1944. But most significantly, Eugene Klein is the dealer who purchased the sheet of inverted jennies from William Robbie, who discovered it in Washington, DC on May 14, 1918. Next slide, please. Uh, we've already seen that one. Again, that's one of my mess ups, uh, Paul. So we'll go to the next slide. Now I'm showing three of these little tiny covers because I could fit one on, I could fit all three on one page. Uh, they're not exactly to scale. You can see the stamp in the top left cover is a little bit larger, it appears, than the other two, meaning that by comparison, it's actually smaller. And I put the sizes of these things. They're tiny, they're just not much bigger than the stamp uh, underneath them. Uh, also, you can see that someone tried to run that tiny little cover in the top left through the uh, machine canceller, which uh, mauled the cover, creasing it. And subsequently, uh, presumably the postal employee figured out what had happened and hand canceled it. Uh, the cover in the right-hand corner made it through the machine canceller, surprisingly, but uh, it's, uh, it was skewed in the process. Next slide, please. Uh, these are dual canceled FDCs with a machine cancel and a hand cancel, but they were dual canceled for different reasons. Uh, the top Brookhaven cache went through the machine canceller but it was upside down. So the cancel was in the wrong corner, as you can see. Uh, the mistake was identified most likely by the postal employee and then rectified with a hand cancel. The Raleigh cache on the bottom has a little bit different story. Uh, my presumption is that it went through the machine canceler. It was handed back to the servicer who then requested a soft on the nose cancel uh, at the time for his block of four. Next slide. A uh, couple of uh, or three printing errors. This is the ER Cassé. Uh, ER or IR rather was a chiropractor from Indianapolis. He was the most prolific cache maker of his era. Certainly his Army Navy caches are the most common. Uh, he produced caches until 1940. His sister continued the line until 1951. Interestingly, in 1950, she married Millard E. Peck, the founder of the Fleetwood Cache Company. So they weren't gonna have caches in competition with each other. Uh, so they continued the Fleetwood line. The uh, IRO caches died and it was Fleetwood from then on. Well, our last slide, a couple of oddities. Uh, the top uh, IRO cache is, has dual cancel. The, fun that, the thing that's interesting about the dual cancel here is that the hand cancel is dated 30 August 1939, and it was canceled at the New York World's Fair Rural Post Office, uh, Rail Post Office. 
my supposition is either this was lost somewhere in the New York City Postal Service for over three years, or the owner of the cache took it to the World's Fair and requested a uh, complimentary cancel at the real post office. The second option is probably more likely. The uh, What's funny about this second cancel or second cover uh, and the last FTC in the presentation is that it's not actually an FTC because it's got the cancel, but no stamp. And I've never seen one like this. And the question is, did this go through the mail stream? Was it a handback uh, cancel? Uh, I don't know, but it certainly is an oddity. So that's all we got time for. I'm a little over and I'll take your questions. Round of applause, please, Mick. Just simply phenomenal. I'm looking at everybody clapping. Just, just thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Mick. Yeah. You want to check out the Mutual Benefit Insurance Company in Huntington, New Pennsylvania. They, ah, good from job. 1908, and they still exist. Oh wow. Okay. Huntington, Pennsylvania, Mutual Insurance, Mutual yes. Benefit Insurance. Good job, Dick. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a quick question because you showed the plate blocks and I, if I recall, there were four different plate numbers, right, for them. And you showed a few and you mentioned two. So can you find all four used on the first day or do I want to make sure I understand that correctly? No, right? no, you cannot. Right. Only the first two. Okay. And then for the second two plate blocks. Yes. There only appear on second day cancels from Washington, D.C. Ah. Okay. And I have those. I just didn't show them. No, no, thank you. Okay. I just wanted yeah. to clarify. All right. Good. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Very helpful. And you did also show the book, Postmark West Point. I have that book in front of me from my good friend, uh, uh, Joyce. Um, and I, I, you know, uh, from Jay, Jay Martin. Uh, and I know he's also, for those that are interested, and I'll share it with you too, Mick, when it comes out, where he's publishing an article, I believe, in our April Excelsior for the Empire State Postal History Society. So he reached out to me not long ago and I put him in touch with our editor. And so we've been working on that as well. So I know you two have a lot in common and you have his book. We, we um, do. And, yeah. and uh, I give him examples of uh, a lot of my stuff, uh, you know, which he's illustrated. He's publishing also, not only that article in the New York State Postal History Journal. Yes. He's publishing a long article that's in the queue in La Posta about yes. the history of West Point Post Office. Yes, that's correct. Exactly. So no, that's that's great. I'm glad you're in. I knew you guys were in touch with each other. We just talked not long ago. So, so yeah, we, we uh, try and link up at stamp shows and stuff like that. Excellent. Excellent. I think he's a, is he a 74 graduate? I think he's a 74 US, USMA he, 74. That, that's correct. He, yeah. he was, uh, he's uh, five years behind me. I'm class of 69. And I didn't start off working at the White House. I started off as a rifle platoon leader in Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. any, other, any other questions, please? Yeah, I have a question on the autograph covers. I understand that, as you were saying, that in many cases they would mail them out to someone to get their autograph on them. And presumably that happened within a few weeks of the issue of the stamp. The one exception to that would have been Doc Blanchard's autograph. Yes. So I, I assume that in 1937, nobody had ever heard of it. That's correct. He so, was still in McCall, South Carolina. So from a first day cover collector's point of view, at what point does an after the fact signature become too after the fact? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, if it wasn't somebody as famous as Blanchard, I never would have shown it. And if he didn't have such a great story. Uh, so I guess if you were going to exhibit, you wouldn't include it. You'd probably get points deducted. Although I'm not a judge, so and I uh, <laughs> thank you, Rick, for that. Do we? Yeah, need the to other thing I noticed yeah, is yeah, I on the plate blocks that you showed. It, I think there was only one that still had the bottom selvage. The, many, most of the others that had the bottom selvage removed and. It's only like an eighth of an inch wide. So 
seems it would hardly have made a difference to have left it on. One would and, think so, but it seemed to have been common practice. Yeah. We certainly wouldn't do it today. Right. Can we take the slide deck down, Paul, just so everybody could see each other for Q and A? If that's yeah, helpful? I just leave. Does anybody have any questions on specific slides or any specific yeah, slides? Exactly. Yeah, right. uh, yes. uh, uh, Mick. Yeah, Mick. I, I have one for you. I don't know if you saw it. I don't know if anybody else did. On the airmail cover, the bottom one. Did you read the name of the street? Uh let me see. I'm looking to see. Way where, back uh, in the beginning. Yeah. The street may oh yeah, no, keep going back. The street made me laugh. There. Next go back. Oh no, go forward. One another one. One more. To, there, uh, oh, back that one. one right there. That, oh, back up. It was a one that with the calligraphy writing. Yeah, with the calligraphy. I think it's yeah. Tecumseh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that made me laugh. How ironic. <laughs> Yeah, that they have a statue of Tecumseh at the Naval Academy. Right, I, I've never seen that a few times. Yeah, so I don't, I, don't, I haven't, I've been to Indianapolis a lot recently. Uh, I need to figure out uh, where Tecumseh Street is. It's probably real close to the statue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because he was born in Indiana, if I recall. I don't know. I don't remember who's in the yeah. office. Mm -hmm. That just made me giggle. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's could, beautiful calligraphy, though. Yes. Could could we go back to the slide uh, with the first day cover postmarked in Annapolis? Mm. Right there. Uh, here it is. About the fourth. There it is. Yes. Right. Uh, if you notice, it's post. It's got an AM postmark, which I think would have been really hard to come by train mm -hmm. from West Point down to Annapolis. And I wonder if they may have gotten some sheets there, or maybe somebody flew down with them. Uh, my guess is they never changed it all day. I've never, you know. And yeah, I, I think mean, the AM, they left the AM and the CDS and it would have been PM. And that's just, they kept it the same. Is that what they, they just, just never changed it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Boy, they Bob, that's a great observation, Bob, because yeah. we have overlooked that AM. Good, that's good catch. Point. Good catch. Excellent. Other questions, other slides. I've never seen more uses of one stamp. And first day covers in my life. This has been great. It really has. Yeah. You say that given I, the state I, of I, education I, at the time, what else I, yeah. it would have what made else it I, down the same day. What else I didn't show was all Mick, the I have a question uh, about the one, one, one second, George. Mick, you were going to say you didn't show? Go ahead, please. Uh, all the production stuff, the uh, proofs, the photo essays, uh, you know, the all uh, uh, production errors like over inking and perforation errors and all that kind of stuff that's the, probably the you know the first part of any exhibit on first day covers. You want to talk about how it was designed and uh, who designed it and you know plate blocks that are autographed by the engravers. There was three, uh, one for numbers and letters, one for portraits, uh, one for vignettes. Actually, for Army, there's just two, the vignette and letter engraver. All the rest have three engravers. But all that stuff is, is just not showing you. I just didn't have enough time. And anyway, I wanted to demonstrate that for not much money, these, these kinds of first day covers are just not that high in demand. Uh, DA Lux maintains a spreadsheet of who collects what issues. And if I start another first day cover exhibit or collection, I'd make sure that nobody else is collecting what I'm collecting. 
Because when you're competing with other people for these items, it just drives the cost up. But there aren't a lot of guys that are collecting the Army series of first day covers. So I can get really rare stuff at low prices because there's no competition. Doesn't that always help, Mick? In any area that we all want to collect, to know who might be out there or who might not be, so you could at least try to assemble as yeah. broad of an amazing spectrum of what you just showed with us, showed us, right? Mm -hmm. It really gives yeah. you that ability to, to expand the breadth of the study. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. No, thank you. George, did you have a question you wanted to ask Mick as well? I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted Mick to finish his thought. And you're, and you're muted, George. And George is still muted. While George is muted, I have a question for you, Mick, while where he's unmuting. With some of those personal correspondence or even the, you know, the, the, the official correspondence, and I know most, you know, first day covers don't really have any contents. Were any of those that were sent because of the nature of who was sending them from A to B, whether government related, did any of them have any letters within them or letterhead or stationary uh, that you yeah. know of within these? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. The, the ones to... Uh... Wallace, the Secretary of Agriculture from uh, Farley. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some other covers to uh, Hicks that include letters. Uh, you know, and I've got covers that are sent by the first assistant postmaster general, the third assistant postmaster general, covers uh, that are on corner cards from the Secretary of War and, and, you know, a lot of different corner cards from government officials. And those were really not business related, the letter or contents, they were more personal, is that correct? Or they were business? Well, let me see. And then George, we'll go to you now that you on mic. Yeah, please. Yeah, see, can, I don't know if you can see. Yeah. Right in front of your I, face, Nick. Yeah, put it right okay. in, move it there. Yeah, there it is, yeah, yeah sure, That's perfect. It. Perfect. Addressed to the Secretary of the Navy. Yes. You know, from uh, Farley. Uh, so they do have contents and they were communicating even within on that first. They got it. Yeah. Yeah. This, like, uh, you know, here's one. Here's here's the communications from the first assistant postmaster general. You know, this is the letter that's in a first day cover because Farley was not the only one who sent out. Mm -hmm. uh, first day covers. Uh, Assistant Postmaster General did as well. And let Thank me see. You. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. George, did you have a question now that you're uh, on mic? Please ask Mick. He's, he's yes. available. Yeah. The two Farley autographs. The two Farley autographs looked like they were different, even in a quick cursory view. Can you go to that slide? This one? Farley. Back. There's a double. Is that it, George? He just signed quicker. No, yeah. the one, one, the top one and the bottom. Yeah, they do one, look both of them had Farley signatures on. Oh, Farley. Yeah, these are Farley. Yep, this is it. Yeah. There's Farley up here, and down here. Yeah. Do you have a question, George? I, I, I'm, yeah, I must watch too much porn stars. But do you think there were auto pens used? Pawn! It's those pawn two stars, not different. porn stars. It, yeah, it's pawn. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Correct. <laughs> um, so the question, that's pretty funny, George. The question is, you know, I mean, those clearly look like one was maybe sung quicker than the other, but those are both the signature. Make. Those are well-known signatures of Farley, correct? I mean, those are identified, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm sure they are, but I just wondered if they were, even auto pens were accepted as he was just in a hurry when he it's signed his surname on the top not, cover. Not the original signature. So I be. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think those those are original signatures, Mick. There's no doubt those are original from him and not. Yeah, him. I yeah. think they are. Yeah, agreed. I agree. Um, I have a question about the Crosby, if I could ask that too, because you know we've all seen those right tipped in. Right. With various, you know, with the ships, et cetera, et cetera. This one's very, you know, of course, it's it's an image of, of uh, West Point. Right. Which is how, how common were those for him to, to put those together? There could not be many of those, are there? Yeah, there are not many at all. Uh, and that's, that's probably the most expensive cover I showed today. Oh, yeah, go, that, there that, it is. That's it. Yeah, because I have a few that, you know, with, you know, number of naval ships, absolutely, right? That, you know, yeah. of the period. And the first time I'm seeing this, a Crosby cache yeah. for this at this period, yeah. so that to me is... Now, these are two of the period postcards that show the administration building. Can you see those clearly? Yes. 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 Okay. So if I put together an exhibit, you know, these may go in there somewhere saying, you know, the first day ceremony was conducted at the administration building. Here's what it looked like in 1937. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? This has been a great session. Great Q&A as well. Any others? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Last call. But it's not beyond the pale that that is a... Uh, fake Farley signature that uh, it's possible. I haven't had it uh, expertized. So Mick, you're at home, you've got a pen, you've got a few covers and you're just signing a few Farley autographs. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's, great. <laughs> That's great. I think if they were faking it, they would have used green ink. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. That's a good point. I didn't think about that. That's a, excellent, yeah. Uh -huh. Very good, well, thank or, you, sir. Or brown, or brown liquor. Right. <laughs> Can we have another round of applause for Mick again? Just a phenomenal presentation. And we thank you, sir. Just just phenomenal.